You got to start with the good news. Number of Americans hospitalized with COVID-19 is now down 80 percent. That is since the January. Is this true? Is the pandemic finally going to end? Soon after. China is experiencing its worst COVID outbreak in two years. I should have known. Today on LightSight, we're going to talk about uncertainty, distress, and how it popped up during this COVID-19 pandemic. More importantly, we're going to talk about how we can manage it as we continually traverse this ever-evolving world. Although it's been more than two years since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, many of us are still wondering when is it going to end or perhaps thinking, am I going to be infected by it? Even today, we are still haunted by feelings of uncertainty because of the pandemic as if it were just day one. Uncertainty is defined as the psychological state of not knowing. In turn, you can then experience what we call uncertainty distress, which are the subjective negative emotions that you experience because of your state of not knowing. In this case, we are mostly clueless about the situation of COVID-19 and our future with regards to the pandemic. When we are uncertain, we start grasping for things that may not even exist. But in our attempt to resolve the distress that we're going through, we then look for things that we don't know or look for an answer. During the pandemic, a lot of us couldn't understand things like why it started, how it happened, how to control it. And these questions brought about a lot of panic and distress. Uncertainty during the pandemic also had other faces, such as anger, frustration, or even in some extreme scenarios, rage. In the short term, whether it is in the present or the anticipated future, when we are uncertain, we tend to feel regret for the choices that we've made. Guilt because of the things that we did or didn't do, and sadness and grief at everything that was taken away from us prior to everything happening. Numerous studies have shown that our cognitive functions and our behaviors have been greatly affected during the pandemic, and I'm sure you can identify at least one thing that has changed about you because of it. To put these feelings of anxiety in a math equation, research suggests that anxiety can be seen as this. Anxiety can be seen as your perceived likelihood of actual danger multiplied by perceived awfulness or the cause of danger divided by the sum of coping and rescue factors. The key factors here are your perceived likelihood of the danger and the perceived awfulness of the danger. When we're experiencing anxiety, we tend to overestimate a threat, making it seem like it's bound to happen to us for sure, and when it does, it's going to hit us real bad. When in reality, they're rarely as bad as we portray them in our heads. And from that anxiety, it evolves into fear, and the threat then becomes more imminent and feels like it's approaching you faster than before. To understand the uncertainty caused by COVID-19, we also have to understand illness uncertainty. This is defined as the inability to determine the meaning of illness-related events. Since in COVID-19, especially when it started, and even now that we're all getting vaccinated, the unpredictability of catching the symptoms or the virus itself may be a reason why we feel uncertain. Another factor to consider into illness uncertainty is the lack of a clear diagnosis and the lack of treatment options. In the first few months of the pandemic, many countries were scrambling trying to understand how it started and how dangerous it really is. Because of the sudden impact of it, it was very difficult to communicate all this information to the public. And even as more scientists and researchers started popping up dedicated to understanding COVID, there were conflicts in information being spread, both in scientific findings, but also because fake news started popping up, or that the information was too ambiguous or not quite as comforting as you would like during those times. Going back to the equation that we talked about earlier, our perceived uncertainty of the virus can relate to it being a threat, either as the likelihood or the seriousness of the virus, or rescue factors as treatment in the equation. It was found that we have an intolerance 
towards uncertainty to an extent. People who have high intolerance to uncertainty find situations that are uncertain to be upsetting, threatening, and undesirable, regardless of the actual probability that that negative thing may occur. Research has suggested two factors that contribute to this. First being our natural desire for predictability, uncertainty, we just want to look for things that are sure. And the other is something called uncertainty paralysis or the inhibitory intolerance of uncertainty. Basically, when we're faced with something uncertain, we don't know what to do. So from this, we can say that the intolerance of uncertainty is us being uncertain and being upset and being bothered regardless if we think that the outcomes will be positive or negative. In other words, it's not that we're concerned about the outcomes, it's just that we're not sure what we're going to get and that's why we're negatively affected. With all this being said, how do our behaviors change when we're faced with uncertainty? The anxiety and worry you feel leads to several changes in behavior. A few being that you tend to avoid events or activities that could potentially induce negative experiences. If you do choose to go to these events, the time and effort needed to mentally prepare for any possible negative outcomes takes up a lot of your energy and is mentally draining. Others also experience procrastination during decision-making due to their worries, and we repeatedly seek reassurance due to the perceived worries. Additionally, we engage in behaviors that aim to reduce the feelings of uncertainty. And we do this in a couple of ways. Sometimes we tend to over-engage in certain activities. We over-prepare by asking ourselves so many questions, doing endless research just to make us feel safe. On the other hand, some of us under-engage and just avoid these situations altogether. So we procrastinate and distract ourselves so that we don't end up doing the things that need our attention. Impulsive behaviors also help during times of uncertainty because when we're impulsive, we just stay in the present and do not think of the long-term negative consequences of whatever we're about to do. Being indecisive is also possible and can lead to inaction. When we're uncertain, we usually have the three choices that we talked about, over-engagement, under-engagement, or impulsivity. And since this is already hard for us to choose between two of the three, imagine choosing one from the three, it often ends up that we just give up on choosing one of the three and just do nothing at all. This results in what we call the uncertainty paralysis, where we end up doing nothing when faced with uncertainty. We also sometimes engage in flip-flop behavior, which means that we do over-engagement, then we flip over to under-engagement. Or basically, it's when we choose two of the three options and try to do both. Compared to being indecisive, this is arguably worse, as this behavior takes up more of our time and is a very disorganized way to approach a situation. For example, let's say you're uncertain if you want to go to a party given that it's COVID-19 but you know what you impulsively decide you know what let's go YOLO and then when you're there you start questioning your decisions wow am I even enjoying so what do you decide to do you over engage you start trying to talk to everybody and as you do you start feeling stressed about the whole situation and just questioning why you even did it to begin with so if we were to map out how a situation would cause us to experience uncertainty distress it would look like this. First would be facing a real world situation or reality. From there, there are three variables that could lead to uncertainty. Let's first look at the variable of actual threat. Here, an actual threat is overridden by a perceived threat which tends to be overplayed or exaggerated and as a result leads to uncertainty, distress. Next variable would be actual uncertainty which is very similar to actual threat the actual uncertainty presented in a situation is overruled by your perception of uncertainty leading to distress. Lastly, the variable of life disruption refers to the interference of a real-world situation in a person's life. This means that the situation that changes your everyday routines may lead you to engaging in behaviors that reduce uncertainty or experience situational intolerance of uncertainty. In turn, this results in uncertainty stress. It's important to note that during these possible stages of experiencing uncertainty distress, dispositional intolerance of uncertainty 
moderates the variables I just mentioned. This means that once you confront a real-world situation, how high your tolerance for uncertainty will play a huge factor in determining whether or not you will experience uncertainty and distress. With that, here are a few tips or reminders when you're in situations where you feel worried and you feel uncertain. Whether it be because of the pandemic and its future evolutions that we don't want to face, or whether it be personal problems or global problems. Number one, acknowledge how you feel. If you start feeling the slightest bit of uncertainty or worry, take some time and examine these feelings and the situations that they're usually attached to. Try to consider how you really feel about it and try to process your thoughts about it with your friends or any trusted person. Merely acknowledging your feelings of uncertainty is a great step towards self-care and management of distress. Number two, focus on the short term. The more that we dive into the future and its never-ending abyss, the more we get overwhelmed by long-term uncertainty. So try to take things day by day. Focus on what you have control over and focus on what's most important at that time. Try to concentrate on your short-term needs. And you can also try to break down your weeks or days into achievable tasks that you can take off like a bucket list. With that, number three, it's important that you recognize the achievements that you make. It doesn't have to be anything grand, but a tick in your bucket list or a to-do list is something worth celebrating and patting yourself on the back or shoulder for. The past two years, and I guess life in general, has been very difficult. And taking the time to recognize and identify the ways that we've developed despite the circumstances is a practice that we all deserve. Number four, make sure that you only do what is comfortable. Go at your own pace. Life often feels like a race, but it really isn't. The moment that you feel uncomfortable or unwell, it's okay to take a pause and it's okay to call a timeout. But there is a huge difference in calling it quits and recovering so that you can start over and keep pushing. Number five, and I think at this point we are quite masters of this. Decide what works for you. In the same way now that workers are more aware of the benefits and the practicality really of working from home, let us also take time to see what strategies and setups work best for us and that will put us in an environment that will make us likely to succeed. Again, this doesn't have to be anything grand, but personally, I found that taking a five-minute walk every two hours or so during my workday helps clear my mind and it's a new habit that has stuck with me. And I'm sure that all of you watching has developed one new thing too during the pandemic. It's easy for us to fall down in a spiral of what-ifs, especially given the world's current situation. And things are better with countries opening up once again, businesses recovering, and us just having the basic freedom to go out once again and interact like before, albeit with a little restriction of the masks and vaccination. Regardless, what we have learned from the COVID-19 pandemic is that there may be situations in our life where the beginning, the present, and the future can just be one big question mark. And despite it being uncertain, we are called to continue living and continue pushing and striving for our goals. From this video, it is our hope that you found a way or a resource to help you cope should you face uncertainty, distress in your life once again. Never forget that everything you need to face the problems in the world are already within your reach. You have you and all the strength you have inside and the people around you who support you. Follow us at Lightsight on Instagram. Hit the subscribe button and the bell notifications so you never miss out on the latest psychology and simple terminology. This is Jim. Let's keep on living. Thanks for watching.